to the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Augustine, the very fine pastor of this great church, and to Mrs. Michelle Augustine Esquire, to the Reverend clergy here assembled, to the officers and members of the great St. Joseph African Methodist Episcopal Church of Durham, North Carolina, to this wonderful music ministry, and to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus the Lord, ladies and gentlemen, let me say special greetings to my brother Curtis and to Matthew and Thomas who are here today. I want to also say a special uh, greeting to my campaign manager when I was running for uh, publisher of the Amy Church uh, in the person of Henry Allen Beelan IV. Uh, he was just about 13, 14 at the time, uh, and probably two feet shorter than he is today. But <laughs> I'm happy to see my beloved nephew uh, seated back there. Wave your hand, Henry Allen, so they can see you. Amen. <laughs> he is here. As I think he's visited with you. Uh, he is here at Duke University and serving as a quarterback there. So I'm happy and very proud to see him uh, here today. <laughs> And to all of you, once again, my brothers and sisters, I greet you in the name of the risen conquering King at whose name every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And to his name we ascribe power and dominion and authority now henceforth and forevermore. Let the people of God say amen. Let the people of God say praise the Lord. Let the people of God say thank you, Jesus. If you're happy to be alive today, come on and throw your heads back and shout hallelujah. Now come on and put your hands together and give the Lord praise, for this is the day the Lord has made, and we should rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, my soul, make this boast in the Lord, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Come on, you all, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together, for the Lord is good. His mercy endureth from everlasting to everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Come on, taste and see that the Lord is good. And I declare one more time that he is worthy to be praised. If he's worthy, tell your neighbor before you sit down, he's worthy. Come on, put your hands together one more time and give God praise today. Who is worthy to be praised? I'm honored, sisters and brothers, and humbled to have this opportunity to share a word on God's behalf on this 153rd church anniversary kickoff celebration. We have assembled today to celebrate the vision, the mission, the work, the sacrifices, the sermons, the prayers, the songs, the souls, the baptisms, the celebrations of the Holy Communion, the discussions, the offerings, the meals, the relationships, the love, the empowerment, and the comfort of 130 year, 100, 153 years. And so we say to God be the glory. We say to God be the glory, sisters and brothers, because as we sit here and as, as we are assembled uh, through means of technology on Zoom and on Facebook, we have survived and thrived another year. There are so many, so many, who have started out on this journey with us, who have slept into eternity. But through the grace and the mercy of God, we are still here. And we are blessed today to come to the altar of God. Praise the Lord. We are blessed today to come into the sanctuary and on this communion Sunday to come to the altar of God, to feast on the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, symbolized by the bread and the cup. And so we give God praise for this day. We come, sisters and brothers, happy, but we come in humility because it is only by God's grace that we are here today to celebrate. I would that you look with me to the book 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm not going to read the entire passage, but just verses 27 through 32 in your hearing. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and the blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. 
But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And we want to preach using as our subject today uh, this hymn, this hymn of the church, And Are We Yet Alive? If you bow your heads for a word of prayer. We are grateful, O oh God, for this opportunity that you give to us to stand behind this sacred desk to deliver your word to your children. Anoint us for the purpose of preaching that our coming shall not have been in vain. Even now, gather in our wandering and our scattered thoughts and hold them captive in these moments that we will receive all that you have for us to receive today. Plant them deeply within our hearts that they will produce fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. This is our prayer. In the matchless and holy name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. Uh, I have not been in church many times since the pandemic, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. This sermon is going to be about three hours. And, uh, <laughs> and even before I get to that, I'm going to sing. How about that? <laughs> How... Can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? Things so undeserved, yet you gave to prove your love for me. The voices of a millionaire angels cannot express my gratitude all that I am and ever hope to be I owe it all all to thee, to God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God His blood, he has saved me by his power, he has raised me to God be the glory. For the things he has done, for the victories God has won, for the things he has done, he has done. That still doesn't count against my three-hour preaching time. <clears throat> uh, during the pandemic, um, Bishop McKenzie, who was the chair of the Publications Commission at the time, and I determined that in an effort to keep us together, we needed to uh, provide different avenues through means of technology for us to assemble together with believers. And in that moment, we began what has become a Connectional AME Church School, where we have been uh, together, uh, I think we started probably with about 150 people, 
uh, on Zoom. And now we have uh, been seeing upwards of 600 on Zoom and another 200 and 300 on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. And so that ministry has grown. And even though others have, many of those who uh, journeyed with us have returned to their congregations, uh, some who don't have Sunday schools at that hour still sojourn with us. And others who have uh, Sunday school at other hours of the, in other hours of the week uh, journey with us as well. Also out of that has grown uh, an insight prayer group that meets every day at 12 noon Eastern time. Uh, during the last few weeks now, we have been uh, celebrating our time together and devoting ourselves to God in prayer and in praise by focusing on hymns. And we celebrate uh, by learning as much as we can about the original intent, or I shouldn't even use the original intent, uh, but the history behind hymns. And so I want to share the history uh, behind And Are We Yet Alive Today. In, 1917, in 1749, uh, Charles Wesley penned a hymn that he and his brother, uh, his brother John, would begin to use at annual meetings of Methodists. This great hymn of the church was written during a time when itinerant ministers rode the circuit on horseback, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes they preached in churches, and when congregations would not receive them, they preached outside in the elements. The weather, the terrain, undomesticated animals, th and threatening diseases all conspired to make life even more uncertain for the Methodist preachers who sought to preach the power and the unsearchable riches of the gospel to a lost and ruined world. And so when these had lived through a year of pain and promise, passion and peril, they made their way to the appointed meeting place where they could be refreshed, revived, and renewed and have the fire within them rekindled. They did not arrive by planes, trains, and automobiles. They did not have the luxury of cushioned seats and carpeted floors. They did not have sophisticated sound systems and lush music provided by numerous instruments. But they were glad when they heard someone say, let us go into the house of the Lord. They did not have emails to inform them of the passing of their colleagues in the gospel ministry. So I imagine they entered the meeting place looking around and waving and greeting and seeing who was there and who was missing. While their hearts may have been heavy for those whose voices were silenced from answering the role, I know that those who had survived that year were excited to join together and sing with uplifted voices, and are we yet alive? and see each other's face, glory and praise to Jesus give for his redeeming grace. It is a joyful declaration of thanksgiving for the su sustaining power of God, but it is also a statement of committed relationship. Seeing each other's face is a reunion and a responsibility, for I cannot see you without seeing what you have and what you lack. Your eyes, thankfully, are not covered by masks, are the mirror to the soul. I cannot look into your eyes and walk away if I see hunger there because I am duty bound to see what I can do to satisfy it. Nor can I walk away if I look into your eye and see the fire of joy that I am duty bound to, to celebrate with you. This Holy Communion today, this Holy Communion service is the opportunity to see, to hear, to discern, yea, to judge how the other members of the body are doing. What condition are they in? What troubles have they seen? What conflicts have they passed? It is to ask the question, how is it with your soul? It is to submit to a thorough examination of motives and action. It is to undergo a spiritual peer review. It is to be scrutinized by the old and the experienced and observed by the young and expectant. It is to step onto a theological scale and to weigh in so as to be sure that during the course of the year out there in the world that some fancy sounding fables and fiction did not affix itself to your faith. It is to be vigorously interrogated like iron upon iron so as to sharpen the intellectual faculties, ecclesiastical commitments, and theological beliefs. Our kneeling today 
at the chancel rail at the altar is the crouching down of the sheep scurrying under the shepherd's crook, seeking to get into the sheepfold while the shepherd examines every sheep one by one to ensure that no injury endangers the life of the sheep. It is to hear some testimony to the overcoming power of God. It is to hear uh, that everything is going to be all right. It is to hear the old soldiers declare, I once was young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. It is to be reminded that God is a battle axe in the time of war. And when you have been broken and battered and bruised by meetings and misunderstandings and miscommunications, when your good is evil spoken of, when you've done the best you can and even your friends don't understand, it is to be reminded that there is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. And Zoom and Facebook cannot suffice. You have to come into the sanctuary. You have to see and be seen. We've got to see. Look around. I'm, I'm handsome, but look nearer to you. <laughs> we have to see each other's faces. And I know that we have lived and are living through pandemics, but we have to touch. So you've got to show up. Hit your neighbor and say, show up. You didn't say it loud enough. <laughs> Email and text messaging cannot properly convey all the information that must be gathered when we come together. And social media is dishonest. We have to show up and we have to look at each other eyeball to eyeball. We've got to feel the strength of the grip and the warm of the embrace. We've got to be together. When I was in college, I didn't like to go home that much. I didn't like to go home because I was doing some things I had no business doing and I knew if I got home, they'd know it. Yeah. <laughs> I knew if my mom and daddy could see me and look me in my eyes, they would know that I was doing something that I had no business doing. So I stayed away. Hear me. I did not want my father to catch a whiff. <laughs> of where I had been and what I had been doing. But there came a time when I was forced to come home and sit down at that table. I had to submit to be looked at and looked into. I had to answer questions and I had to fidget while they read the subtext to my answers. But my dear Christian friends, if I had not gone home to submit to the rigors of that examination, and to submit and to sit at that table to celebrate who I am and whence I came, I could have been destroyed. It was hard, but it was what I needed because there was salvation at that table. There's healing at that table. There is deliverance at that table. The broken is made whole at that table. And identity is solidified at that table. And that is the nature of the gathering of which we are a part today, this entering into our anniversary celebration. So befitting is it too that we celebrate the Holy Communion today. For this sacrament typifies who we are together in this meeting. We are the body of Christ. I'm going to go off script a minute and simply say, I know it's comfortable to sit and eat while the computer is on. 
I know it's more comfortable. You know, I paid a lot of money for these shoes, but they got hard soles on them. And I have not been wearing these shoes a lot. But I put these shoes on because you know, that's the kind of stuff you put on when you come to church. And I, and I get it. Folk don't want to put on, you know, they got this term now called hard clothes. <laughs> Folk don't want to put on hard clothes. But you are a part of our body. And it's fingers and toes missing. We are better together. Amen. Amen. The technology is great for people who cannot make it to the sanctuary, but it should not just be an option if you can make it to the sanctuary. You should come to the sanctuary because we are a body. Uh, Christianity is not an isolated, it's not, it's not an individual religion. We are a community of faith. We are supposed to be together. Can you hear what I'm saying? Somebody has to tell you when your elbows are ashy. We are the body of Christ. This service is a time for us to come together and see each other's faces and discern the body. Something happens when the saints of God gather in the house of worship to sing the songs of Zion and to lift high praises to our God. I'm telling you, there is power in the gathering of Christians when we come together in unity and fellowship. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers and sisters come together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the hand that, uh, uh, that went down to his beard, that even even went down to the train of his garment. It is like the dew of Hermon. And as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For it is there in unity that the Lord has commanded the blessing. Even life forevermore. Healing flows in the room when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. Healing flows. God has commanded the blessing to come upon us when we come together in unity. Love and mutuality, responsibility and accountability for the discerning of the body. Lives can be saved in communion when we discern the body rightly. Relationships can be, dead relationships can be resurrected when we discern the body rightly. Sick folk are healed, broken people are made well, damaged people are restored. Those who have left the church can be reconciled if we discern the body rightly. The weak can say, I am strong, and the poor can say, I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And this is what Paul argues for in 1 Corinthians 11. The occasion for this letter is crucial to the life of the church. The members, upon reading it, would have to clarify their intentions. Do you want to build the church or destroy it? Are you concerned only about yourself? Or are you concerned about the body? See, I can't be a Christian only concerned about me. And I stand often, as I do today, to come against that notion of coming to church to get a word. You come to church to give. That's why I argue with preachers all the time about calling services an experience. It's not a worship experience. It's not IMAX theater. It is a worship service, and you give in service. And if we do it right, the preacher ain't the only one sweaty and tired when we leave here. The members of the church at Corinth were in danger of undermining the very essence and meaning of the Lord's Supper. They were allowing divisions to come into the church because of what, uh, and because of this, what should have been a holy communion was becoming nothing more than a common meal. 
But what's more, the members of the church were not even regarding the usual practices of hospitality. What seems to have happened there is that people of a certain level of society would arrive at the meal site earlier than the others and they would eat and drink the provisions before the poor folk and those who were enslaved could even arrive. So the rich folk would be full and drunk off the wine and when the poorer folk came to empty tables and picked over food. And Paul is saying this is a travesty of the Lord's Supper. We are supposed to be together. Say together. So the Lord Jesus came to tear down the walls that would divide us to obliterate class distinction and to create a community of people who loved and cared for one another, who are responsible for one another, who are accountable for one another. In this way, the wrong folk could be corrected, sick folk would be ministered to, hungry people fed, lonely people comforted, mean people loved, outsiders brought in and the fallen lifted up. The supper of the Lord was instituted to remind the body of Christ of this. But the people devolved into their typical classist elitist behavior. And Paul is careful to point out that those selfish, greedy ones who refuse to care about the poor and the sick and the destitute, the outcast and the others and the differently abled are no different than those who drove the nails in Jesus' hands and feet and pierced him in the side. And one of the worst ways that people demonstrate their lack of care for the poor and the destitute, the sick, the outcast, and the others is the refusal to vote. Mm. And don't get messed up with these uh, deluded Christians who say, you know, we don't need to involve ourselves in politics. We are Christians. As long as your body is in, as long as your spirit is in this flesh, you have a responsibility to participate in what is happening in the land where you live. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to cheat y'all out of a couple of hours here, but when we come to the table, we must examine ourselves and recognize that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we don't know where we would be. When we come to the table, we must examine ourselves and come to know that we didn't earn a seat at the table, but it was God's grace and God's mercy. When we come to this table, we must take an introspective glance and realize that it was God who made a way for us out of no way, that it was God who picked us up out of the muck and mire that was our lives, that it was God who saw us when we were sitting under our own fig trees, that it was God who called us out of darkness into his, into his marvelous light. But let a man, let a woman examine themselves, for when you look at yourself, you can look at others differently, but let a woman, let a man examine themselves. For when we look at ourselves, Paul suggests, then we will not know how to eat the bread and drink the cup. For judgment ensues when we don't judge the body rightly. When we discern the body rightly, we know that it is love and mutuality and responsibility and accountability. And what God is calling the church to is intentional intimacy. Amen. God is calling the members of the church to really be a family, to gather around the table, to develop mutual relationships in which we should shoulder responsibility for one another and hold each other accountable and not just talk about each other. When we do this talking about one another, we are not judging the body rightly. And this is why some folk are lethargic and some are sick and others are dead. The Holy Communion is not a, just a meal, it is not just a ritual, it is a sacrament. It is an appointed means of grace and we are to invest meaning in our coming and receiving and thanking and breaking and giving and receiving. Uh, it is an enactment of our unity. It is an embodiment of our interconnectedness. It is a celebratory remembering of the love of God in Christ Jesus that God has power to bring healing and deliverance. And what we do here is not magic. The power is in the presence of God manifested in the love and care and concern and mutuality and recognition and celebration of each other for the other. For the other. For the other. For the one not like you. So it's rural and urban. Rich and poor, sick and well, in and out, up and down, high and low, high yellow and honey dripper. 
wide and narrow, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It is to come together and to be the church, whether you bring in the bankroll or the widow's might. Paul says when you come together, you have to take care of one another. For the church cannot go merrily along uh, full of itself and intoxicated by the beautiful atmosphere of worship, but we must engage the powers. As long as we are in this flesh, we must engage the powers of this world. And it is not about political party. Tuesday is not about political party. Tuesday is about enacting justice and equity for all of humankind. And when we go into those polls, we are called as Christians, sisters and brothers, to stand against evil in high places and not just in the poll, but everywhere we go. Amen. Yes, we have been promised life more abundantly, but we cannot live high while others die. And so this is the crucial question. And are we yet alive and see each other's face? Do you see me sitting next to you on the pew? Or are you just trying to be seen? Did you see me, see me in the parking lot? Or were you just trying to get a space? Did you see me in the doorway or did you walk over me to get your program? Did you see my face in the aisle or were you just trying to get your choice of seats? Do I matter to you? Do you care about me? Don't you know that we are members of the same body? And if you discern this body rightly, we can move beyond the question to the celebration. And are we yet alive and see each other's face? Glory and praise to Jesus give for his redeeming grace, preserved by power divine to full salvation. Here again in Jesus' praise we join and in his sight appear. What troubles have we seen? What conflicts have we passed? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. But out of all the Lord has brought us by his love. And still he doth his help afford and hides our life above. Then let us make our boast of his redeeming power. Which saves us to the uttermost. Till we can sin no more. Let us take up the cross. Till we the crown obtain and gladly reckon all things lost, so we may Jesus gain. Amen. and stand with me. I know you're not supposed to be doing no touching. I know you ain't supposed to be doing no touching. But you, some of y'all came together, so I guess you can touch them. <laughs>